and uh, technology also helps startups in the not for profit uh, segment as well we should not think that startups are used only for uh, creating businesses that churn out money startups can also be used as a concept in not for profit as well so we have six examples here chimple is a startup which is using artificial intelligence and gamification to help children who are in the age group of 4 to 8 years to learn on their own using a software loaded on android tablet and this has been developed by a person who observed that his security guard would not be able to teach his child once he moves out of this community for a certain job or other specific reasons then he thought that how would they ensure that the child is place agnostic in terms of learning she has been going to the school here but she will not be able to go to the school later so i should provide a product which will be helpful to such underprivileged children so is a not for profit startup and it has come up similarly dost education which gives audio curriculum to the parents who can in turn provide it to the children then reap benefit again builds up communities who solve social problems through gamified applications intelli health tech based high technology primary health solutions for the health workers which can be communicated and which can be deployed in the rural areas aqua safi is an iot based clean drinking water supply solution for villages then simply blood is a tech based communication medium between the blood seekers and blood donors in case of urgent and non urgent medical needs we also are having incubators and accelerators who have mentorship from different experienced corporate executives and are backed by indian and global multinationals in making that in making sure that not for startup we have organizations like encore with corporate and mnc support and who also offer mentoring by experienced executives to make sure that this kind of uh, not for profit startup movement uh, also gains uh, momentum now when we look at uh, all of these things when we look at innovations ultimately all innovations have to be expressed through design so how elegant is your design that is the integrator that is also the differentiator when we look at design there are several aspects of design as i have uh, positioned here one design drives exclusivity and customization it could be the same capability in terms of technology but the way it is designed and put into a product and uh, provided a visual appeal it drives exclusivity and customization but at the same time design by ensuring that there is a match between uh, variety and also standardization it helps diversity as well as diversification then design can provide flexibility both in terms of manufacturing and in terms of uh, customer segmentation good design ensures value chain flexibility it also has certain unitization parameters so that manufacturing can be undertaken in flexible manufacturing units and when design is uh, standardized and also diversified it drives break even point because by the way of diversification you are able to address larger market and by means of standardization you are able to ensure uh, repeatability and uh, high mark manufacturing economics therefore the break even is ult- ultimately lower so a good design ultimately is like a fingerprint it is unique to a product and very often you can uh, understand that this product belongs to this manufacturer by the way this product is designed therefore it provides exclusivity and customization but a good design also is an internal aspect providing flexibility to the company to be able to manage multiple skus under the same shop floor so it reduces the break even so from a strategic management point of view design determines how the product strategy gets generated and product strategy in turn determines how the business success is achieved so when a startup uh, makes its uh, products it it has to configure how to be successful with a low volume of uh, sale when a startup configures its product it has to be very clear on the design philosophy it has to adopt in a manner that the break even is lower but at the same time the market exposure is maximized and that's where the skill lies 
and providing this kind of strategic design solutions, providing this kind of integrated design come manufacturing solutions itself could be a startup opportunity for people who are good in operational excellence, algorithmic development, understanding of market needs and forecasting, etc. Let's look at automation. When we look at automation, we can look at it as a trend. But when we look at automation going from zero level, which is no automation, which is present to drive, present in India, I mean, to driver assistance, partial automation, conditional automation, high automation and full automation, you can easily perceive that there are opportunities all the way. And it is a way of integrating all elements of technology into one new system. And that itself calls for a lot of startup capability as we move forward. And when we look at the automobile autonomy, you will find that the entire thing has got several opportunities. One is uh, the entire uh, discovery piece of where the vehicle is positioned. So you need a laser, you need a radar, you need a camera, you need aerial, you need sensor, you need altimeter, gyroscope, tachymeter onboard computers, roadmaps, navigation systems, artificial intelligence, deep learning. So all of these things provide automobile autonomy and today none of these uh, products is uh, manufactured as an ancillary product to an automobile company which means that the entire uh, aspect is a veritable uh, attractive field for startup activity. Now, this is uh, having certain philosophical overtones in terms of how the market evolves. For example, there is a shifting uh, mix of ownership versus esteem. Ownership was used to be seen as giving esteem. But today, mobility is considered more important than ownership. Leasing of a vehicle is considered more important than owning the vehicle. 100%. So there are some kind of behavioral changes which are happening in the marketplace which companies like Uber and Ola are trying to capitalize. That is one at one level at which the startups operate at the market positionings area. But for those things to be operated in the actual uh, field, we need still automobiles and that automobile has to be equipped with all these kinds of products. So this is another space where the startups will work. So, the more innovation you can think of in the products, the more opportunities come in the startup domain. So, if you look at the chronology of early call innovations by imagination, visualization and disruption, you will find that from 1901 to 2010, a number of products have been visualized and then put into place by car manufacturers or the ancillary manufacturers and they have given rise to startups which eventually become big companies. So when you do this kind of market factors in technological resurgence, from innovation we are moving to resurgence. That is, you are enhancing the ability of the product, ability of the human per being to manipulate his product for his or her quality of life. And that happens through preservation and repositioning. It happens by providing one product which meets many needs. It also happens by redevelopment and upgrading. In each of these things, there is a kind of tutorial aspect which is involved. In, when you are doing preservation and repositioning, you need protection and nurturing of legacy. You need institutionalization of knowledge. When we develop a product for versatile needs, you, you understand that it to improve the quality of life, but also you should enable the person who is using, understand how he can use the product for many needs. Then when you do a product in a different manner, you need to retrain your employees in line with the changing technologies and reposition them into new roles. So it is not always necessary that legacy products should be forgotten and new products should be always uh, embraced. We should also see to what extent the legacy products can be improvised and improved and ensure that uh, material conservation takes place to the maximum extent possible. Again, another area where startups can be used. For example, uh, various state governments are today looking at uh, having a 15-year time limit for uh, registration of 
old vehicles. That means any vehicle which has crossed the 15 years from the date of first registration will be automatically computer logged and cannot be registered anymore. So it is a way of uh, introducing uh, scrappage policy. Now should that uh, vehicle be scrapped completely? Should there be a methodology by which it is uh, trained to be more efficient and how does it happen? So could engine tuning be a new startup activity? Could engine refurbishing could be a new startup activity? Or could engine retrofitting be a new startup activity? Or could a portable vehicle testing system be a new way to determine how vehicles should be given an extra grace period or how they can be viewed differently for different types of markets, perhaps non-city markets. So these are all the opportunities. So problems are coming up along with development. Problems are coming up with, along with the regulatory changes. So how do we address each of those uh, aspects with a view to conserve resources and therefore help the society would itself be a business opportunity for startups. But to be able to do that, we really need to enhance our patent application strength. As of today, if you see companies like Canon, Samsung, Panasonic, Toshiba are filing thousands of patents each year. So it is very important to ensure that our big companies are also in the forefront of patent filing. And there should be a ground rule that no startup can really call itself a startup unless it has patented one or two of its core technologies and therefore there is an intellectual property which is built in into the startup ecosystem. So if you have 10,000 startups and each startup uh, files uh, two patents at least for the core technology it has, you will see that uh, 20,000 patents are filed and that is a valuable input. And given and when these startups derive their technologies from the university research, the multiplier effect of patent filing would only be much higher. It is uh, remarkable that uh, several uh, Chinese universities are having patent filing levels which are comparable with the patent filing levels of commercial uh, organizations. May not be exactly the same, but the level of uh, research being done which is patent worthy in the Chinese universities is extremely interesting. And that is some model which we need to really emulate in India. And it is also very interesting that there is continuous growth of intellectual property across the board. We may think that uh, in the patents may be filed only in machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks or surgical robots and things like that. But you will find that electrical engineering, instruments, chemistry, mechanical engineering, even civil engineering are uh, open to high levels of patent filing still. That means what? It means that even fundamental established industrial segments are also undergoing significant metamorphosis in terms of their technological edge. And when you look at chemistry, it is no longer the chemistry of putting a couple of chemicals and producing a new chemical compound. Apart from organic chemistry, biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, we got lots of improvements that are taking place in polymer chemistry, in food chemistry. Basic materials chemistry, we have seen how materials technology will influence both uh, consumption products as well as industrial products. Materials metallurgy, surface technology and coating, then nanotechnology, chemical engineering, environmental, etc. We will come to that aspect later, additive manufacturing. But for additive manufacturing, the core is to have materials which can fuse themselves into a product. How does that happen? It will only happen with the materials technology being innovated upon and that is a issue of uh, chemistry, there is a challenge of chemistry. Therefore there is much hope that whether the domain is traditional or the domain is novel, there is going to be continuous technological change and the technological changes are going to impinge positively upon the changes that are required in the end product uh, space. So we, we should look at this design, the innovation, the design as a total ecosystem. We may have proprietary designs, we may have a non-proprietary design system. Components would be there, systems would be there, products will be there. And uh, we need to generate component level IP, system level IP and product level IP. When all of these things combine, then you will have a completely good design ecosystem. There were times when uh, we used to change the designs every 5 to 10 years and have annual incremental innovations in the meanwhile. 
but today changes are occurring at a much faster pace and annual changes are becoming even six month uh, changes but certain technological changes will occur every 10 years still which could be game changes how the industry is uh, going to be used or by the society so science and technology by their nature drive game changing developments and business and corporate considerations limit the kind of game changing technologies although they are in possession of those technologies even a molecule like sugar which may seem to be beyond any change and but is considered essential for ensuring some dietary habits but also contributing to the issues of obesity and other uh, human problems could be modified for example a molecule of sugar can be combined with a molecule of honey and a better honeycomb could be developed or a sugar molecule or the honeycomb itself can be fortified with more minerals more new micronutrients and serve twin purposes or you may have to do it in such a manner that the product is able to withstand cold temperatures as well as high temperatures so as you look at life as you look at uh, various activities we undertake as we look at various inputs we consume as part of our life you will find that there are immense opportunities where new problems can be defined and new ways of solving the problems are developed so we have this uh, additive manufacturing it is going to change the manufacturing uh, methodologies dramatically in future typically we say that a lot of value is added in a shop floor that is a manufacturing setup in a way it is actually a misnomer because no value is added in the shop floor except that components are converted into a product yes that way value is added if you say that employees have spent x number of hours y watts have been consumed and certain support services have been taken all those costs become value added for the product yes it is true value added has been achieved or accomplished in the manufacturing shop floor but if you really look at the way the manufacturing is undertaken that is you take a bar of steel why you take a flowing steel cast it into an ingot or a bar of steel and that bar of steel is machined and lot of material is removed to get a rough uh, profile of the product you would like to fine machine and then you take it to a machine tool and then make it into a cam shaft or a cram shaft and then you do further uh, grinding honing etc to remove the final uh, uh, disturbing parts of the metal and make it into a fine product you will know that you have removed lot of material and actually it is not uh, value addition it is a value erosion that is happening in the manufacturing uh, uh, plant so let's look at uh, the indian automobile industry just some hypothetical example not necessarily very accurate in terms of numbers in 2017 18 the indian automobile industry produced 3 million cars 1 million utility vehicles 0.9 million commercial vehicles 1 million three wheelers and 23 million two wheelers all aggregating to 29 million automobiles of all types based on certain assumptions on the unladen weight or the curb weight of each of the types of vehicles we can estimate that the total iron and steel consumption by the indian automobile industry is over 11 million tons annually this represents the weight of machine parts in the aggregate with the gross weight of unmachined parts being 14 million tons now if 14 million tons is put inside and then 11 million tons has come out we have lost in material metal removal 3 million tons forgetting about the rejections and things like that it therefore accounts for rupees 135 billion annually and this is also accompanied by enormous costs in machining these kinds of uh, losing materials running the machining centers scrap removal coolants cutting and forming tools transport of materials and then recovery of the uh, coolants and the scrap and the effluent treatment facilities which are all adding to the thing so compared to this imagine a situation where uh, powder is added together to make the crankshaft that so that not even uh, even a speck of powder is wasted 
and from design to manufacture you do it elegantly through a 3D route which is uh, generally called 3D printing but actually it is additive manufacture where you add uh, particle by particle layer by layer of uh, material to make sure that you get the product which you require. And this is, has got enormous uh, potential. Micro parts obviously can be made, parts which have got very complex uh, uh, interior and exterior can be made by this. Spare parts can be made because spare parts are typically of low usage in certain cases. So, it is not economical for big firms to produce. Therefore, uh, smaller batch sizes, th this route is ideal. This route could be ideal for lighter parts. It could be ideal even for complex parts. It will be ideal for multi-material parts. You cannot do multi-material parts in the normal uh, uh, value conversion system which I described earlier. Rotors, stators, etc. They are also very well used. Rapid prototyping this is another area. Dice and fixtures, jigs and fixtures can be made in this route. Human implants and prosthetics can be made in this route. Human organic substitutes and uh, imaginatively stem cells can be made at one end and uh, homes can be made at another end. So the potential for this is so enormous that every industry, aerospace, defense, consumer goods, medical, energy, construction, automotive could see additive manufacturing coming into full shape and they are likely to make a big difference. So again, you look at this uh, wheel of progress for uh, additive manufacture, two levels in terms of the parts which can be produced and in terms of the industries which can use those parts, huge opportunity for startup activity. There are domains which we thought were beyond the uh, entry of small companies. They have to be done only by governments, space commissions, space agencies, normal companies may not do. Then we had situation with some privatization, some kind of collaborative relationship between uh, uh, private companies and space companies. And of course in the developed markets such as the US we have got companies such as Amazon and Tesla their founders uh, founding uh, space uh, companies. But then there is a growing requirement of space technology catering to multiple needs. There is a fundamental change that is occurring in the space industry where there is a requirement for a growing requirement for smaller low cost satellite and this pro provides opportunities for startups in space technology and uh, they could cover uh, various areas like lighter and smaller payloads, economical propulsion system, low earth orbit systems, optical communication systems, space infrastructure support systems, import substitution efforts. So it is an emerging opportunity. So while it, is, it has got relatively higher startup costs compared to the other areas, but the demand is determinate and the people who are looking for these kinds of services are uh, very interested in paying the appropriate price to get these things. Obviously integration of newer sensor technologies and the newer digital technologies such as artificial intelligence will provide the competitive edge. But the role here is that they cannot be vanilla vendors, they need to be really technology driven vendors who take part in the space corporations R&D value chain from the beginning to the end, understanding where, where the exact needs are. So, if you see the various industrial revolutions, we looked at this way earlier also, first in revolution, second revolution, third industrial revolution and the fourth industrial revolution. You can also kind of uh, say that the first wave of technologies were largely mechanical devices and they were designed to act as per loss of movement, whether it is a automobile uh, engine or whether it is a printing press, they were uh, moving mechanically. Wave 2 technologies were electromechanical devices wherein uh, the power of electricity added impetus to the way the mechanical uh, products performed their functions. So speed and power got enhanced, the versatility got increased. Wave 3 technologies are electronic technologies which provided the first means to bridge the distance. They provided the first means to change the mode of communication. So if you transmitted a message in a particular uh, thought form to an actionable document, the document for example was electronically transmitted in a different form and electronically reproduced in the original form. 
Therefore, Wave 3 technologies helped bridge the distances, enhance entertainment. They were designed to improve the quality of life. But the current Wave 4 technologies, they are combining the digital, mechanical, biological systems. They are trying to revive, regenerate life completely. Now, if you look at Wave 4 technologies, there are four or five areas which I can think of. One is precision medicine, second is artificial intelligence, third is robotics and fourth is green technologies. These are four important uh, sub-classifications of the Wave 4 technologies which are having a big role as we go forward with technological development. And again, each of these uh, sub-segments is an important area of uh, startup development. But the expectations from Wave 4 technologies are quite uh, different this time. It is no longer, as I said in the beginning, about more for more. It is uh, more with less. So people want uh, food security, governments want food security. We all want energy security, but we want uh, least pollution. We want our age to be defined much better. We want to understand aging as a principle. We want to reconstruct, redevelop ourselves, so digitization of biology. Digitization of entire life, digitization of businesses has always been there. But understanding the business transactions with much greater depth and with more human intuitiveness than water security and mobility essential as always, but it should be clean. So when we look at these kinds of wave four technologies, we go back to what we said as the new developments that are happening, which are fundamental innovations breakthrough innovations which make the impossible possible. How do you do self-immunity or self-programming a universal disease curing activity? How can we eradicate cancer through ensuring our own cells have got the immunity to fight cancer and then destroy it? Regardless of the stage of detection of a disease, we are able to cure the disease. How can we do those kinds of uh, unimaginable things as possible? That's the goal of uh, Wave 4 technologies.